thanks for setting up the stage, uh, CJ. I greatly appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Tuesday. Hope you are doing phenomenal and staying safe. My name is Arjun Jaggi, and uh, I am a technologist with experience in closing key technology deals and delivering innovative solutions to complex problems at all levels within the organization. I'm working in IT industry uh, from a decade now uh, with Federal and Fortune uh, 100 customers in technologies like ERP, uh, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, augmented reality, IoT, and 3D printing. I joined Sistran in March this year uh, as a technical account manager, and my responsibilities in the organization includes pre-sales, post-sales, and technical project management. Now, I would like to give you a little bit big background on uh, Sistran. Uh, so Sistran has been a leader um, in the machine translation field now for our 50 years, uh, so five decades. We provide the highest level of translation quality, uh, facilitating multilingual collaboration and reducing translation costs. Sistran machine translation makes internal and external communication seamless, improving global productivity and international business development. In today's webinar, uh, we'll, we'll understand the terminology with uh, Sistran's NMT, which is Neural Machine Translations. Uh, three, four years ago, we had no idea about coming up with NMT. Uh, so the dis dictionary magic, which we're gonna talk about today, or I would say the functionality to work with dictionaries has been developed over decades uh, by taking uh, you know, constant feedback from distant industry verticals. And that provides a tremendous value on top of uh, neural machine translations. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to post them in the Q&A section below. And uh, now I'll hand over to Philip uh, uh, for his introduction. And then I'll walk you through uh, the agenda of this webinar after that. So over to you, Philip. Great, thank you, Arjun. Uh, hello again, everybody. Um, we, uh, my name is Philip. Uh, I've been with Sistran for about eight, eight and a half years and uh, seen quite a revolution in uh, the technology. Uh, long ago, it was RBMT, rule-based machine translation. Then when I joined, it was in the midst of the statistical machine translation revolution. We added that combined with rule-based to do a hybrid. And now about four years ago, as Arjun mentioned, uh, the a new era has started. And in fact, we're already in the third or so generation of that. It's going very fast, developing so much more quality and speed. So very excited to share some of the insights, uh, some of the technology that still is very valuable, even though it started uh, 54, 52 years ago. And uh, let's go, let's get started. Okay, thanks, Philip. So today's agenda is, um, I mean, we'll, we'll walk you through the profiles, uh, the dictionaries, uh, the TMs. Uh, and uh, then what's in a dictionary, you know, what you can expect uh, when you have to work with a dictionary, uh, understanding the dictionary coding engine. Uh, and then uh, Philip is gonna walk you through a bunch of use cases, examples on, you know, how to create a dictionary, how to do file uploads uh, with terminologies, expressions, and if there are any typographical errors, any noisy ASR, any sort of um, OCR glitches, OCR is optical character recognition, uh, and then multi-target dictionaries, um, how to do anonymization, identity protection, do not translate. So there are a bunch, bunch of features and functionalities. And um, um, I mean, and then beyond dictionaries, you know, going beyond like, you know, how to access dictionary through API, you know, large uh, glossaries. And uh, then finally the feedback management, that's an internal feedback, uh, you know, if there are any errors, you're translating from one language to another. And uh, if you wanna give a feedback, how you do that. So we have a feature for that, which we'll walk you through um, as well. So over to you, Philip. Thank you very much. Let's get started. So, and in fact, before we get started, let's understand one thing. Do we really still need this? Why, why do we still need terminology dictionaries? Why do we need glossaries? Um, I mean, isn't it time now with neural machine translation where it just does it all? 
ask yourself, can it not read your mind, right? And the thing is, there are plenty of places in the language, not just English, but where you see something and you think you understand what it's talking about and it's actually something different. Like UPS is that you're shipping a parcel there for the holidays. You're gonna be using the United Parcel Service, but if you're working at a computer and there's a power outage, like I'm hoping not today because I have the roof workers putting some solar on my roof, uh, we have uh, potentially a need for an uninterrupted power supply. And in German, we translate that differently. It doesn't stay UPS all the time. It could be a USV, Ununterbrechbare uh, Stromversorgung. Some of our translation engines detect that depending on how much information you provide in the sentence. So if you have just UPS, it stays UPS. There's not enough information to say what it really meant. But in German, sometimes it needs to go to USV and some of the sentences will contain additional clues. The context will be kind of embedded in those extra words. And therein lies the difficulty, but also the magic is that you can sometimes actually expect the engine to do it right. Especially if there is clues that point to the fact that, yeah, okay, so you had a truck delivering and that was a UPS truck, but what was delivered was an uninterrupted the power supply. And so you translate things differently. But still, you'll have something like UPS needs a UPS. Um, yeah, that actually also works. And uh, that's really amazing that the neural machine translation without any additional clues can figure out if it's trained properly, if it's trained on a lot of different scenarios that are very specifically now tested in these translations. Right, so there is there is a lot of capabilities in the engine itself, just by itself, a generic engine, and even more so if it's trained. But here's another example, AMTA. A few of you probably know what that stands for in our universe. Uh, we, in fact, uh, I was relatively new here uh, with Sistran, and in 2012, we uh, attended AMTA right here in San Diego. And that begged the question for me, what does that actually mean? And why do we need to clarify that? So I had these couple of slides for a presentation uh, talking about how AMTA or just dictionaries for acronyms and other things can be really useful, right? I, I Googled and found that there were at least seven meanings for AMTA. And so here, and we were number seven. We were the last one at that conference. So American Massage Therapy Association, that's not the one I went to. Uh, American Music Therapy Association, a little bit more interesting, uh, I love music. And then there is the Mock Trial Association, I try to uh, stay away from that, it's always trouble. Uh, <laughs> then there is the Antenna Measurement Techniques Association, I'm actually an electrical engineer, but I hated antenna. So <laughs> still, it's uh, amta.org, this is a non-profit. Uh, and then there's others, there's number five is the American Travel Abroad, now that's not the ATI, or the ATA, but why do we need four letters to do an abbreviation of three words? Uh, you know, that's how it's challenging at times to get the sense and even make sense of language at large. All right, so here's another example, uh, very important nowadays with pure water or good water, clean water, the American Membrane Technology Association for water filtration systems. Uh, and then of course, AMT, web.org is the one that has the machine translation of uh, in, in the Americas. And so uh, it's, it's not always clear just from the abbreviation or a single word or even two, three words, what it is that's meant. And when you translate it, sometimes you keep the same abbreviation as is, but quite often, especially going to Latin or from Latin languages, you have a, an order, a word order that changes and the abbreviations are different too. Now, there are some exceptions like FAQ in French, la foire aux questions, which really means something different, but is actually used to express the same thing. And so the challenge is, is that a single acronym or a term can mean many different things, like a POS, point of sale quite often, right? Uh, and then pain of salvation. Uh, my initials, Philip Ottersteiger, uh, there's two in the medical world, polycystic or pulmonary ovary syndrome. And then there is a couple of rock, uh, hard rock and, and punk rocks. And then there is a product of some mathematicians, Pomona, uh, California has a train station called POS. I like to call it the power of Sistram because you can make it better if you need to, if you feel like you want to go through the effort and it's not a big effort. So we see cases where we really benefit from having control of that terminology, right? When and why do we still need dictionaries? Uh, well, because sometimes it's just not clear or not clear enough. And for instance, in medicine, UPS might be even yet another one, like unidentified prenatal syndrome. 
uh, that's still the UPS. And if you want to translate with that meaning or with that sentiment or with that uh, thought process behind it, sometimes you have to spell it out. Sometimes you need to give it a little bit of a boost and tell it what you really meant. Dictionaries will help. Uh, it may not all uh, be easy, but you may need to connect the dots even beyond this uh, different lines. Different chapters may contain additional clues. We're not there yet. Uh, we're translating pretty much mostly one or two, maybe three sentences at a time. Even back in the rule-based engines, we did that so that we could see two, three sentences earlier, what were we talking about? So we could deduct what was the gender or who was the subject and what was the object of that. So we have some clues about what to translate now. Uh, but there may also be typos, right? We're all humans, uh, and even robots will make, typo make typos. Uh, and during an earthquake, you know, these things shake. <laughs> so there may be new terms also that that's never been seen. I mean, just like a kid never heard of rocket science until they see something land uh, or, or take off first and then land again. Uh, <clears throat> there is uh, all sorts of scenarios where uh, we really just need to give it a boost because uh, the engine hasn't learned it yet, hasn't tr been trained trained on it. And then on top of that, there's colloquialisms. There's so many cases where you say something and you really mean something different or two different things mean the same and it's still something different, right? That's cool or that's hot. It's something different in Spanish. Do you say es frío, caliente? No, you say es genial, right? <laughs> it's genius. Uh, there is, this is not new to us, right? But back in 1975, Sistran was selected to help the cosmonauts and the astronauts on Apollo Soyuz. We were actually, uh, that was our first language, Russian to English and then the other direction. And we had a really good uh, dictionary system already, quite impressive, definitely usable to help the astronauts and cosmonauts communicate if they had difficulty, because they only had a few months to learn each other's language. So with this trend, you may not necessarily reach the stars because uh, this was still low orbit, but we can at least get you into orbit. And it's a heck of a view. And here's a quick a pop quiz, if I may give a clue. What is this called? What is this thing here? Uh, is that a meteor, meteorite? It's actually popcorn. And as you know, I painted this and I ate the popcorn afterwards, but this is popcorn. These are kernels of popcorn. And it's just another visual example of like, you, you think you know what you're looking at and it's really something different. Uh, so, so understanding that uh, we want to use dictionaries, how do we create it? And if we create one, will the system automatically use it? Or I like to call that automagically. Uh, no, it's, it goes to a higher order resource before it decides what dictionaries to use. It's the profile. So a profile can contain one or more of your dictionaries. It can also contain other resources like TMs, translation memories, normalizations. Uh, that's another thing we do. Uh, monolingual resources, basically monolingual dictionaries. Um, and then also other options, filtering options, caching to make it faster, to make it uh, not translate certain things. There's, there's a variety of options. So all in all, it's there to help you get closer to the perfect, whichever way you define perfect. So what is a profile? And, and in fact, if you've used Translate Pro, I don't see any options for a profile. You translate English to Italian, you see the source, you see the resulting target, but there's no option here to select the profile. Well, it depends on which product you're looking at. We have some products where it's right there and others we hide it until you have have done a first translation. In this case, you translate it, and then on the lower right quadrant, you'll see some additional uh, ways to translate the currently selected sentence. If it's just one sentence, that's it. Um, if you have multiple sentences, let's say a paragraph, you copy paste it, uh, you just select one sentence, and then you'll see on the right side options for alternate engines, or alternate profiles, which may actually be using the same engine, but maybe one of them has also some extra dictionaries, glossaries. Or they may, in fact, typically, the most typical scenario is that they have just been configured with different engines to begin with. So here's one that we partnered with TED, and you have a lot of presentation material according to Ted, that's uh, been used for the training of this engine. There is uh, one, there's of course a generic engine, there is some IT domain, there's also a generic but more formal. Many of the languages uh, that we translate have an option to say, well, let's just stay formal, not colloquial, not uh, informal. Uh, there's others, uh, you know, manufacturing, automotive repair, medical, and so on. So these, these are profiles with a purpose, and usually that purpose is served with a, a different engine. But in addition to that, you can also add your own resources. And so if you have uh, the, uh, the ability to pre-select your profile, you know already that you'll be able to do a better translation. For instance, here for English to Chinese, uh, you click the plus button, you select the profile, and then uh, either you... Pre uh, 
pre-select it or you give it a couple of clues. There's a couple of different ways to actually choose a profile and you have the system choose it for you based on those clues. We call them selectors. Uh, or you, you see the list and you pick a particular one. Chinese might be traditional, might be IT domain, might be something trained with Corona crisis uh, terminology. Uh, so there's a, a lot of different ways to do this, including with the API, right? So if you develop an application, you integrate some translation in something with JavaScript, uh, whatever it is, you have a lot of things you see here. You can also do and even more of that through the API. But it starts with the profile. You need to select the profile. And once you have a profile, you can say, okay, let's create it dictionary and put it in there. Of course, a profile starts with identifying the language direction. It's not English to Spanish, it's Spanish to English. You have an engine that does that. Which one? Is it medical, sports, automotive, etc.? And then at some point, you add your own resources. And if you don't, it will pick one. And it may pick the right one because it has an algorithm by which it's it looking it looks for uh, engines or profiles available and it checks who owns it. And if it's the Sistran, that's sort of the fallback. If it's one of yours, it's it thinks it's probably better. It was trained specially for you. You have a reason why you created it. It's specialized, it's customized with dictionaries, etc. There's also different sizes. Uh, there's a medium size, M category. And then there is an L size. They come up at the premium, but they're better. They're a little bit slower, uh, but they produce better translation. So you can choose those. And if it finds one, if you let it, it will look for that first. Uh, and then there's also, uh, so who's the owner? And there's also domain-wise. If you only have generic engines, it's going to pick that. But if you have one that's in a non-generic domain and you didn't say which one you want, it's going to take the non-generic because that's very likely the better one. So in the profile, there's a lot of decision-making happening. And setting it up for perfection is really something you do once. You, you set up a profile, you already have one probably, you could add dictionaries to that, but we recommend starting with one new one where you say, okay, let's pick this existing engine and then start adding a dictionary. Create it if it's not in existence yet. You can import a file, you can create one empty at first and gradually, you know, after it's set up, you just gradually improve it. You have feedback coming through the feedback system or through a little email or something and you can say, oh yeah, this we can fix. Let's put that into the glossary. And gradually you can have one or even multiple dictionaries. You can have by different departments, or you can have the terminologies that do translate versus a, a separate list, a separate dictionary just for do not translate terms. So in a profile, you'll have a, a number of things uh, to focus on initially, just the name you want to give it when you create it. Usually it's deducted from the engine you're going to select. So I, I usually recommend first selecting the engine when you have multiples to select from right the, the the trouble with choices and here we didn't select a generic one we took one from the it domain and then we reflect that in the name of the uh the profile but we also say well there's more to it so beyond it or it plus or better than it or it2 whatever you want to call it leave it in there make it a single word with dash underscore or just connecting the words uh but something that indicates what's the domain at the base in the engine but then the fact also that there is more to it. And what is more to it is down here. Right? These are the extra resources, such as dictionaries, translation memories, normalizations, which is a special type of dictionaries. And so that's where you go. And with the dictionary editor, what we just saw was a profile editor. Now in a dictionary editor, you'll say, well, what can we actually put into such a dictionary? Right, so the interface is relatively simple. You you go to the resources if you have permission to do so. You have a file, maybe a Excel or, or maybe a plain text file. And the things you can put in there is quite varied. Uh, you can import the file. You can manually put them in down here. You see a field for the source, the target, also the part of speech. Uh, POS, it, it will detect that automatically, or at least it will try. And that's a very significant piece that's going to take a little while if you upload tens of thousands of terms. Uh, but it's it's something that happens and does, and we do, th this is where the history of Sistran is shining already, right? This is where you see, oh yeah, these guys have done this for a couple of years at least, uh, 50 to be precise. So, so what you do is you load a term and the system uh, that receives this is what we call the coding engine. The Sistran coding engine is a key part you want to understand when you work with dictionaries. It looks at the word coming in like box in English and then in French, la boîte. And so it's analyzing it to see if it already knows what that is. Maybe it has it in a monolingual dictionary. If it's an exact match, 
bingo, we got it. Uh, if it's not, or if there are uh, duplicate similar ones, or if there are ambiguities, or if it's only a partial match for the first couple of letters, but it could still be something like that. It's going to take a guess, and that's where it might take extra time, but it's going to find eventually something that it says, I think it's a noun. Uh, it could be a, a verb, right? I could box this. I could put it in a box, like to box, or it's the box. So it has a noun and a verb as an option. In French, boîte is probably the box, although it could also be your, the conjugated form of limping. So here's another verb, right? Uh, so, But it's going to decide which way can it agree the two are the same, and then it's an aligned bilingual entry. So that automatic detection is something it can do by itself. Many times you have just uh, terms like uh, something that's uh, to be translated, but then uh, when you want it translated differently, you may need to provide additional information or clues. And uh, what happens after you've set it up, uh, here's you created a dictionary and you're using it uh, before you create a dictionary. Uh, the verb uh, help, to help, uh, the past tense, the negated form, all of these just translated based on uh, Ayudar. So you could have that translated Ayudar, Assistir, maybe Soportar, like I can't support this guy or I, I, I can't stand him almost colloquially. Uh, same thing with the nouns, right? There's a couple of different ways that could be translated. You simply put that term in and now not only does it take help for Assistir, but even a great number, if not all of the conjugated forms, the subjunctive, the past tense, and so on, the future tense, it will build on that as well. So we we don't just have a string for string replacement. This is what I call an intelligent uh, dictionary with a purpose to be really useful. Uh, so you could have it all assistir, assistido, assistire, et cetera. Uh, and uh, you know, how you work with this, if you only initially experiment, you can do this manually, but at some point you probably already have a, a dictionary or a glossary or a list of do not translates. And so here we go, uh, maybe in a spreadsheet, you need two tabs. Uh, one is do not translate. The other one, the multilingual has both sides. Uh, or what we prefer, what we recommend is the uh, bi-text, the bilingual aligned text. Uh, and that one will work. And there's also a couple of others, like some term-based exchange formats, XML-based, TBX. We have a couple of formats we import and then two or one that we export. Uh, we recommend, I would recommend this one is the most powerful, but even in others you have, if you don't necessarily have all the columns or extra options, you can often add details in what we call the coding clues. You can, you see in fact a few here, you can say to think or to create, uh, to close, uh, you help uh, in parentheses, you can provide additional clues. You can say it's a verb or it's a noun, short uh, N for noun. Even in some languages, you might need to say what uh, gender it is, M for masculine, F for feminine. When you export it, it provides more information again because it has analyzed it. The coding engine stored some information and you may have additional details like confidence factors and other things. So do that, by the way. Uh, it's highly recommended you save it in as many formats as you have available because you might need it in another program, maybe a CAT tool, or you might need it uh, to reload it later after upgrading a system or even creating a second, let's say you went from a dev server to a production server, or you add another server and you want that to have its own dictionary, but some of them you copy over. Uh, so let's take a look at a few, a few examples. Acronyms, proper nouns, and nouns are probably the most typical ones uh, we think of when we think dictionary, glossaries, uh, terminologies, right? Terms are often proper nouns, like names, people's names, geographic names, secret code names that's going to carry the company into billion-dollar profit, stuff like that. And some sometimes these are single words or acronyms, like a couple of letters, but sometimes there are multi-words. You know, you could have happy, you could have hour, you could have happy hour with a different meaning, or perhaps in some languages, you keep it the same, but you might have something that's very big and very long. So the time it takes might be a little bit uh, challenging. It, you know, you don't do millions of uh, entries or tens of thousands of entries in, in just a few seconds. Uh, you might you might find that it uploads really quickly, but it does need take it, it does take time for the coding engine to digest and analyze it. So uh, here's some examples of something else, expressions, right? Something that actually could be a sentence by itself. You might say, well, why not just put that in the translation memory? And you can. But what if you want that to actually be used also in other sentences that build on that? 
right? I like it today better than yesterday, or that's how I like it, or ask me why I like it, or yes, I like it. Uh, you know, there's a number of things that are really an expression. It's not a noun or a verb, it's a combination of it, and several things with adjectives and prepositions and, and a number of things, right? It could be a full sentence. You take away the question mark or the period, it's now a part phrase or what we call an expression. And those are very powerful too, because they solve a timing problem. When you have a match on that, you already bypassed analyzing. During translation, it has to analyze each word. Well, if you bypass it, it's, it's a bit faster. Uh, we, do, we usually recommend those not to include punctuations because you will have them at the end uh, when you actually start using it in a translation, you'll probably have those, but you also want them to match if you don't. Like if you do a chat, if you do a dialogue with a lousy punctuation, or it's something that comes from a speech recognition, ASR, that didn't have the ability to detect the proper punctuation, uh, and there are still some out there. Uh, so you have a couple of ways, let's say all could speak, right? We all could speak Spanish or we all could speak Italian. That's the same string sequence, the same expression. And many times you will translate that the same way. It's an, a good idea to put that into a glossary, into a dictionary. Adjectives, verbs, and their inflections. Uh, a note about that, right? So when we put something in like a noun even, it has a plural form many times. Not everything has a plural form, but even more so adjectives and verbs, they can inflect. The system will be aware of that and prepared to use the proper ending. For instance, if it's a, an adjective that uh, inflects based on the gender, of the noun at the time it is used uh, with translation. Now, I, I'm not promising it will always do that. Right? It's doing pretty good though. And you will see some cases that, uh, yeah, it's a big time saver because it has that uh, ability uh, to, you don't have to put uh, you know, 20 different entries into the dictionary for just one verb in 20 different conjugated forms. Uh, it has internally that capacity because it's based on that coding engine that where this was an absolute necessity for the rule-based engine, now it's a luxury, but it's a great luxury to have. And uh, same thing with declinations. You know, you, you might say, wait, uh, in German, there are four, Latin has six. We don't do Latin, but we do Russian. There's eight declinations, you know, dative, accusative, genitive. There's one in Russian where you have to justify the verb. You have to say you had an intent to do that. And it changes the ending of the verb just because there was an intent. Um, and I don't know what it was called. I, I learned Russian long ago and forgot most of it. I can say I don't speak Russian very well. That's about all I remember saying uh, with a decent accent. Um, but th the whole thing is also, yeah, on the prior slide, uh, you know, other things that you might uh, want to do is like dental assistant. Uh, the plural forms, you can actually put them in if you need to translate it differently or capitalize it differently or whatever it is you want to do differently. You can have two entries. Uh, very similar ones. Uh, you may even add in parentheses extra clues about, okay, all my dental assistants are female. Let's put the gender in there. So it's always going to assume that because that's a tricky one. We're not just there yet with regard to uh, identifying on the fly what gender it is and change certain details like the pronouns and, and other things uh, based on the gender of the noun. Uh, we do that with the trained engine. So you can specialize the engine if you want that. But uh, having that on the dictionary, not just there yet. It didn't exist at the time of the rule-based engine. Now we do have the ability to force the gender. And then that's great because if you, know, if you have a scenario where it's always masculine or feminine or, or neuter, you can actually have it properly translated accordingly. And you can have many profiles. So your profiles will uh, be multiples if you have different departments, different projects, you have training material, you have marketing, you have research, you have sales, you know, different ways ways to translate in all of these cases. So you have profiles for different scenarios. Uh, and there's also cases where it just can't figure out what it is. The coding engine is trying to find, well, is this a noun? Is this a verb? It's just too different, you know, a clue with an uh, acronym. And it, so you can actually overwrite that. Uh, another thing you can do with it is planting an Easter egg. You can, uh, an Easter egg is something in the video gaming uh, concepts where you have a secret skull somewhere in a hidden cave and when you find it, you're happy, right? <laughs> and you collect it, you earn a couple of points. Uh, you can use it in a similar way to simply say, well, if I type something like this is the TM, 
This is an example of a translation memory. You can do the same thing in an expression in the dictionary, uh, but you can basically use that to not just translate it, but instead actually reveal what is the TM that responded to that question or to that source. So we call that an Easter egg. And uh, you typically would use this to do version control. Right. Every once in a while, you wonder, wait, uh, how, are we using the right profile? So you type this, and if you only have one dictionary uh, in the system, or if you have a system for two or three different dictionaries to possibly respond, like is this this is TM1, or show me TM1, show me TM2, uh, you can see it respond to you and tell you, yes, I'm here, or no, I'm old, I'm still the one from last semester. Uh, so you know if an update is needed, or it hasn't been released yet, stuff like that. And then, of course, you can also deal with reality, which is the typos, the noisy speech recognition, OCR glitches when you translate PDF files or even just raster images, JPEGs, TIFFs, and so on. Um, you know, sometimes you have glitches that are really strange. You have donde uh, with a, an accent on it, or el avión also with an accent in Spanish, el, el está aquí, there's accents, right? And some of these can look different. Like in the lower right corner there, you see a number six, almost the same as an O with an accent. If you make it small enough and you have to squint to see it, trust me, the OCR has to squint too. <laughs> it has a limit of the resolution. You know, uh, If you give it 70 or 96 DPI, but it's, it's trying to go for 300 DPI, but the data doesn't have it, it cannot detect this to be different, especially if it's highly compressed JPEG. So you have challenges, uh, sometimes because a different font is making it look closer to that number six, or it's something else. And when you try to translate that after the OCR is done, you have something that doesn't look too Spanish anymore. And uh, the translation is sometimes trained for that, but if it's something that it hasn't been seen, uh, it's it's probably going to give you a lousy translation, but please don't blame the translation for that. It's the OCR phase. Now, we, of course, integrated together inside our product. We have several solutions to translate PDF files, some of them with OCR and some of them without, depending on what type of PDF you're dealing with. Uh, but yeah, the, the nature of this is usually uh, somewhere in the filtering or somewhere in what we actually get to translate is not what we think it should be. And you can fix that with dictionaries. You can put in a term that says uh, AVI6N translates to airplane, right? It's not avion, it looks like AVI6N. Uh, and we can still get the perfect translation, which answers the question, um, well, how good is machine translation these days? Well, in this case, it's better than the original source. Right? So you'll, you will see that you can really do magic with this. Uh, sometimes even the, the neural engine, because we train them on these typos as well. Right? So we, we do actually provide trained engines that are not only aware of perfect spelling, because that also changes. You have suddenly some accents in Brazilian Portuguese no longer needed because there's, or you know some other things that change. German went through some re, uh, re uh, some rehash of uh, do we really need to capitalize this just to be polite, you know, stuff like that. And uh, those type of things can change over time and they constantly do. Language is uh, a live thing. Uh, some of them, some people will say Latin is dead, but no, it's not. <laughs> it still is very good to know. And, uh, you know, here's some examples. If you, uh, if you translate without those user dictionaries, UD, uh, you might have the AVI6N is not good or dude, where's my plain because this one was avion properly spelled but if it's avi6n dude this is not even donde is or where is it's baffled as to how to translate it but you can fix it you can put the dictionary to good use and now you have the proper translation now it may be a slightly different translation uh, instead of where's you might see where is if you captured donde as where is uh, but that's good i mean you you make it the way you want it right fix it so multi-target dictionary is something that people have also because we are by nature somewhat lazy and we want to open one Excel sheet to have everything in it different, let's say from English to 20 different languages. And so we have a column per language, plus maybe some extras for part of speech and other things. Uh, and yes, you can do that. <clears throat> Our dictionaries do support that. Uh, it's not always what I recommend, but if you want, you can, and it could be sparse data. Uh, not all fields have to be filled with a, a term corresponding. You may have a German translation, but don't know yet how to go with uh, Spanish. Uh, 
there are some limitations though. And for instance, you can only have one Spanish in that dictionary. And if you're doing translations in Spanish from Chile, Mexico, uh, maybe Cuban and European Spanish, you're gonna be finding a bit of a challenge there if you can only have one dictionary that says Spanish target. So it's better to have individual dictionaries for each of the region. Uh, that until the the overwhelming demand arises for us to actually do multiples, right? I mean, it's many times it's driven by customers. You have a customer that wants this, eventually you'll see a, a release notes that has it. Uh, using UDs for identity protection, that's another thing. You can, you know, if it was bad and you fixed it, you can also go the other way. You have a properly spelled name, you can hide the first name to make it look like my twin brother did that instead, right? Or you could you could tell, uh, I'm really Robin Hood, or Reverend Don Felipe, or whatever you want. You can, you can change the, the words through the dictionary. That also works nicely with the normalization dictionary because it's sort of a pre or a post processing mechanism. And uh, so that's that's a very typical use of it. It's also there to change things because they were maybe intentionally trying to hide something. Right? Something that was incognito was actually presented as otigoni or something like that. Reverse spelling, pig Latin, you name it. A lot of things. Extra spaces between the words, between the letters even, right? Pot secret, really meant to be top secret. We can reconstruct that to top secret uh, because we can find string sequences at the source, at the what we call the source normalization dictionary, the SND. So there's a lot of things you can do directly, plus through the interface and uploading files and through the API. Here's an example, the documentation will show you, you have an API for translating text and there's an option for choosing the profile. And there's also a API for actually dealing with the dictionary, the REST API for the dictionary, tons of functions to manage your glossaries through the API calls. And the same thing for what we call the corpus or also known as translation memory. So, um, Perhaps last but not least is, you know, how about we don't want to translate? Right? You can select a couple of different ways to prevent translation. And one of them is actually right in the dictionary down to the granularity of individual words or word sequences. If you don't want to translate Sistran Pure Neural Server, just flag it as do not translate and uh, keep smiling, right? I mean, <laughs> the whole purpose is for, for us to translate, but actually sometimes not. Sometimes we wanna go from American English to British English and we don't want to translate, but we still want to do some magic. Uh, but even within real normal translations, there may be times where there is a product name that you don't want to see translated. And you, in fact, you want to keep it in the original script, right? So while everything turns Chinese, not everything necessarily does, or Cyrillic, if you go from English to Russian, or the other way around, you might still have something, unless you transcribe, transliterate it. But uh, there's a couple of scenarios to be dealt with here. And uh, typical use for DNT or do not translate is actually an entry in a dictionary. So you could have a single dictionary with tons of DNTs, but there's a couple of other cases too. And some of them is like a full sentence that you actually, it's, it's already in, in the target language. So you simply put that in a translation memory and the source and the target, you leave the same. Uh, or you have something where it's in yet another language. And again, you, you don't want to change that. So you could have like uh, cogito ergo sum. Uh, you don't know what that, you don't want that translated. Sum uh, in Latin, I am, but it's also, uh, I think therefore I am. So, but sum is also S-U-M. So it's the sum of something, right? And you don't want that translated into Italian, like to la somma, uh, cogito ergo somma. <laughs> uh, if, if anything, you want cogito ergo sono, but uh, th that's really where we are with uh, dictionaries. And I think I'll leave it uh, to, um, to Arjun to uh, finish at this time and uh, we can take it into questions. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Yeah, so as the conclusion, uh, we have seen, uh, you know, the easy terminologies, uh, you know, the complex uh, expression, uh, how we can fix the ambiguous uh, OCR glitches, uh, pre and post normalizations. Um, feedback feature, uh, which is a very uh, crucial feature uh, just so you know, feedback is going internally. Uh, it's not coming to Sistran. Uh, so when you're translating from uh, one language to another, maybe from Spanish to uh, French, right? There can be some issues. Um, and then if you want to fix that, if you want to have uh, more improvements to that, 
uh, from a specific team internally. You can set as a priority the severity, you know, if it's, uh, if it's important, if it's least priority, and you can rate those translations. You can write it in the description. So everything, if, if you see on the screenshot, everything is mentioned, the language pair, the profile, the source, uh, the current translation, uh, what's, what's the suggested one, right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's a really important feature to have. Uh, that's that's pretty much uh, from from our end, and um, you know uh, CJ, uh, you know if you uh, if you have uh, anything to say, if you want to wrap up. Uh, thanks, uh, Arjun and Philip. So we did receive a couple questions here. So let me go ahead and present them. Uh, one of the questions we received um, says, are normalization dictionaries available on the cloud hosted translate pro system? Oh, so normalization dictionaries on the, the cloud product. Uh, no, they're not, Cur at least not currently. Uh, you, you will see if you have the permissions to edit that depending on your license, you will see dictionaries. Uh, or glossaries, do not translate, that sort of things, and translation memories. Those two main resources are in there, but you will not see the normalization dictionaries or, or simply called normalizations unless you're looking at a different system, uh, the Sistran uh, enterprise server that's on-premise typically, or I mean, you can host it in the cloud, but yeah, the, the SPNS server has that capability. Okay, thank you. And another one says, can you talk about another example of usage of the normalization dictionary both for source and for target. Right. So let's let's think here. Uh, when when you're using normalization dictionaries, you're dealing with one word and not its translation. Right. So think of uh, on the let's say you do a translation from from Spanish to English, but maybe also Spanish to French, Spanish to Italian, Spanish to Portuguese, and you want to capture at the source on the Spanish side some commonly seen mistakes or abbreviations you need to spell out before they go through the rest of the translation process. So that's a typical S and D case, source normalization, where for the Spanish, you say, well, if I see this like AVI6N, I really meant avion. So you have an entry and it's better version, right? It's the evil twin and the better twin. You have uh, two entries, but they're the same language. And one is the corrupt one, and then they have the perfect one. And it continues with that perfect one in the translation process, right? So that's the source normalization as a preprocessor. And then the target normalization is kind of the reverse. It's, you know, the multiplexer, demultiplexer scenario where you say, okay, now I see the translation, but I really don't want that because maybe it's a long word and it doesn't fit in my uh, spreadsheet, Excel sheet, uh, you know, the cell may be too narrow, the web page may be off. Things like that are criteria, usually not linguistic but more uh, aesthetics, uh, what does it look like? Does it sound odd? Uh, is it in domain and so on? So you could simply correct it afterwards with a target normalization dictionary. So you quite often in the profile really have both. You have one for the source and you have one for the target and it just detects at the time of translation, which languages do you go from and to? And based on that, it's gonna see, oh, we do have a, a French, uh, that's the source language. We do have a French normalization dictionary. Let's use that as a source. And then we have a target language that's English and we have a target uh, normalization dictionary that's English. So well, let's make it, use, use it as a target. It's an on the, fly, on the fly decision. And you can quite easily improve things with just one dictionary that way. Right. Imagine again, if you have Spanish to French, German, Italian, and a few other languages, and you notice some problems in uh, in the Spanish, instead of fixing it in a regular dictionary for each of those target language pairs, you fix it just in one normalization dictionary. And you put that in each of those profiles, they all will benefit from the same corrective measures, from the spell checking corrections, from the whatever you do to make it better. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, let's answer two more questions. Uh, one of them says, are these features implemented as pre and post process or empty engine is retrained? Uh, I didn't hear the last part. Uh, pre and post process, what? So are these features implemented as pre and post processes or are MT engines retrained? Oh, or, or are MT engines retrained? Okay, so they, they are pre and post processors, meaning that the NT engine, the core neur, uh, neural machine translation engine is 
looking for these to use it, but it's not retraining itself. It's not a, a training of the engine. It's a on the fly application to the otherwise uh, imperfect translation. Right. And that who knows? I think comes under specialization. I think that's what right, they're trying right. to understand. So, yep. Exactly. So, so it's not doing a specialization or retraining or constant training. Uh, that's something that we do also, but not through the dictionary. Now, you can use the dictionaries that you have perhaps accumulated over time. You can use those in our soon to be released model studio, which is the platform we use internally already for the last couple of years to train engines. And model studio should be released around middle of this month, end of this month uh, for pretty sure. Uh, so we have uh, the solution also to train the engine. And in fact, we're integrating that with you know CAT tools and others where it makes sense because you're doing feedback with the human post editor and translator. They are validating sentences, signing off and so on. And those are great. Those are worth gold and you want the engine to be retrained with that. So through several mechanisms, whether it's a CAT tool with integration with our API, you can have some activity there. There's a variety of technologies out there that are uh, tremendously beneficial and con constantly evolving. So you'll see a, a lot of uh, additional uh, uh, new, new features with that as well. Perfect. And last question uh, we have time for is, can you talk about the context recognition beyond the current sentence, such as from the other phrases in the same paragraph or even another page of the same document? Oh, that's a, a futuristic one in a way. It's, that's interesting. That's uh, really one of the research uh, projects or activities in many of our, uh, you know, ourselves and competitors. There's a lot of interest in translating, not just sentence by sentence. Uh, imagine, for instance, you have that, that acronym UPS that we saw in an earlier slide. You have that in the first page. And in that page, the sentence gives it away as the parcel service. And then, so it translates properly or keeps it as UPS in German. And then in two or three pages later on the same document that you're translating, you are now talking about a computer that was delivered perhaps through that truck and you turned it on and then there was a, you know, an earthquake or power outage of some sort and the UPS kicked in. Right, the uninterruptible power supply kicked in. Now it's a different context, but what if in both cases they are properly detected and then further down 20 pages later, there's not enough clue to know which one. That same word appears again, whether it's a complex sequence of words or whether it's an acronym, it appears again, but with not enough clue to know from that sentence alone uh, what we're talking about. That's an open question, even for humans, right? I mean, it's really right. challenging to know what to do, but we're getting there. It, it will have to make a decision at some point. In the meantime, you can help it get there with dictionaries. If you, if you have a preference, you make that the preference in your dictionary, you make that the preference in your profile. And that way, if you have someday translating something that's a little bit more this way, and another day you translate something a little bit differently, uh, you can choose a profile that's appropriate, and then you minimize the amount of corrections you need to make. And that's where you save money, big time. Perfect. Okay, so we re did receive a couple more questions, but this is uh, all the time we have for today. So we'll answer those in a follow-up email. Um, if you have any further questions, you can um, email us at uh, the email we provided on the screen, beyondlanguage at cisterngroup.com. You can also visit um, our website, cisterngroup.com, and there's also that link to um, our webinar portal if you wanted to catch up on uh, previous webinars as well as sign up for future ones. So um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and uh, Arjun and Philip for uh, presenting um, and I hope that everybody has a wonderful day and stay safe and healthy.